Hi, I'm Scott Succo, your Executive Director of the Liver Coalition of San Diego County. Uh, welcome to tonight's Liver Q&A. Before we get started and I introduce our board president to talk a little bit about the coalition, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Throughout the evening, you'll have an opportunity to post in the Q&A box any questions that you have, and our moderator tonight will collect the questions and then present them to our presenter, Dr. Pakras, at the end. Also, tonight would not be made possible without our amazing industry sponsors, and we have two sponsors with us tonight. The first one is representing Gilead and Greg. There you are. Hey. Thank you, Scott. Just want to say on behalf of Gilead, thanks for having us. And thank you to the Liver Coalition. And of course, thank you to Dr. Pakros, who always like hearing his talks. And I'm sure tonight will be another amazing lecture and Q&A. So thank you for having us. Great. Thanks, Greg. And also with us tonight supporting us is Esai. And Esai has a special video uh, that they'd like to share with you. Great. Thank you, Gilead, and thank you, Esai. I now I like to introduce our board president, Terry Cunningham, to introduce tonight's program. Terry. Yes. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you could join us for another in our series of webinars on liver diseases, uh, brought to you by the Liver Coalition of San Diego. The Liver Coalition of San Diego started last year after the American Liver Foundation decided to close their district offices. We uh, formed the Liver Coalition in order to uh, fill in the gap that was left behind. And one of the things that we're doing is providing these uh, very informative webinars on various subjects uh, dealing with liver, liver disease. So uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, webinar and please check out our website for all of the previous webinars have all been uh, put on the website and so you can view those at any time. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Melissa Ferrari, for, uh, a PA from Script Center for Organ Transplant. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. Everyone, welcome. Again, my name is Melissa Ferrari. I'm a physician assistant at Scripps, as well as the co-chair for the Liver Coalition of San Diego's Associate Medical Advisory Committee. Tonight, we're very lucky to have Dr. Paul Pakros with us. He is a gastroenterologist specializing in hepatology, so liver disease, within Scripps as well, Scripps Green Hospital. He is giving us a great presentation on both primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis, as well as emerging therapies for these two processes. Um, during the presentation, please do look to the side panel of your screen, and as you have questions, please type them in. At the end of the presentation, I'll then field all these questions to Dr. Pakros and we'll have more of a conversation. Um, I believe that's it for now. Dr. Pakros, when you're ready, we can begin. Okay, thank you, Melissa. And uh, let me turn my camera on. Um, well, I'd like to thank the uh, Liver Coalition for the kind invitation today and uh, I'm going to share with you a talk. I'm only, I think I'm only going to have time to talk about primary biliary cholangitis today, but um, I will be happy to field uh, 
questions on both PBC and primary sclerosis and cholangitis, if you have any. <clears throat> um, but I don't think I'm going to have time to go over the slide decks on PSC uh, today. So let me first start by talking about adult cholestatic liver diseases. PBC and PSC are the most common of the adult cholestatic liver diseases, but they're not the only ones. So <clears throat> in our office routinely, we see a number of other of these conditions, probably drug-induced liver injury or DILI is the most common we see, common one we see in the outpatient setting. Graft versus host disease of the liver is a, a rare condition that you see in patients that have had bone marrow transplants. And so there's a sicker group of patients. And TPN induced cholestasis is a group of patients that are we <clears throat> that are basically um, dependent on TPN for their complete nutrition. So that's pretty uncommon. Liver transplant rejection we see like this week, I'm on inpatient service. So we're dealing with liver transplant, two liver transplant rejection patients that have been hospitalized to the pay, uh, uh, hospitalized in order to manage their uh, acute cellular rejection. These other conditions are less common. Intrapatic cholestasis of pregnancy you only see in pregnant females, of course. So what is PBC? Uh, it's now called primary biliary cholangitis. It used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis, but it was a misnomer because um, most of the patients did not actually have cirrhosis of the liver. In the early years when the disease was discovered, um, it was usually found in older females that would be jaundiced, show up in a surgeon's office or in the hospital, and they'd have gallstones you know, because most of them developed cholestasis. Uh, after many years of cholestasis, would develop uh, progressive uh, pigment gallstones, and so they get operated on. Lo and behold, at the time of surgery, they would have cirrhosis of the liver, and half of them would. Um, not recover from the surgery, they go into liver failure and die. So, uh, and that was the first recognition of the disease, primary biliary cirrhosis. It was later realized that there were much milder forms of it, and these could be identified by uh, testing patients for antimitochondrial antibody. Most of the patients were female. Uh, and most of the conditions were asymptomatic in early disease, just with an elevated alkaline phosphatase. Some of these progressed, and as they uh, progressed, this would lead to fatigue, sometimes pruritus or itching, sicka syndrome, which is dry eyes and dry mouth, and then eventually cirrhosis. So PBC um, affects about one in a thousand women ages greater than 40 and used to be the leading indication for liver transplantation um, in the United States. So when we started liver transplant at Scripps in 1990, PBC was the most common disease that patients were treated uh, transplanted for. And it was the most common disease uh, that we transplanted patients for at Scripps. And that was true in the rest of the country. Now it's quite unusual to see a patient need a liver transplant for PVC. Maybe one in a uh, one a year at most. It's just not a common case because we have very good therapies. So as I said, the the name, the nomenclature, uh, uh, it was changed a number of years ago from PBC cirrhosis or to PBC cholangitis, and that's because of the mis the misnomer that most of these patients do not actually have cirrhosis. They do have cholangitis, however. So what are the causes of PBC? It's an autoimmune disease thought to be a combination of genetic predisposition and environmental triggers. What are the environmental triggers? Well, nobody knows for sure, but interestingly, this is a disease of northern latitudes. So the countries where the most uh, literature has been published from, on PVC are, are northern latitude countries, Sweden and England, because they saw the most of it. And um, <clears throat> so it was thought there was something about 
being in the northern latitudes that had uh, that that was related to the cause. In fact, they even looked at pools of water in some of these countries to see if that was the source, but it turned out not to be. And we now recognize PBCs uh, uh, diagnosed throughout the world. That's just the countries where it's most common. The serologic hallmark of PBC is a positive antimitochondrial antibody, and that's seen about 90 to 95% of patients. Uh, in our center, I'd say that um, 90 to 92% of the patients with PBC are female, and 90% have a positive antimitochondrial antibody. And we follow about 150 patients with PBC um, at Scripps, which is probably the, the largest number of patients um, in, uh, in San Diego, there are, probably, there are some big centers in LA and San Francisco that also have large numbers of patients. So the other common disease that we see in females is autoimmune hepatitis. And these two can sometimes be confusing because they occur in the same patient population, same age groups. However, the, they look differently histologically and clinically. So clinically, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, or AIH as we call it for short, um, usually has very high AST and ALT levels, whereas PBC does not. The AST and ALT levels in PBC are sometimes normal. If they're not normal, they're mildly elevated, say one to three times the upper limit of normal. The alkaline phosphatase, on the other hand, in PBC is always elevated, uh, whereas in autoimmune hepatitis, it's often normal. The anti-nuclear antibody and anti-smooth muscle antibody are the typical markers for autoimmune hepatitis type 1, whereas PBC, as I said, the, the typical marker is anti-mitochondrial antibody, which is present in 90% or more of the patients. The ANA or smooth muscle antibody may be positive, in PBC, PBC patients, but usually in a low titer. And the clinical features of autoimmune hepatitis are different. They're flu-like symptoms, fatigue, uh, jaundice if it's a severe case. They usually have an elevated IgG. They may have other associated autoimmune disorders. PBC, if there are symptoms, it's fatigue, itching, as I mentioned, and there are associated conditions Crest syndrome, which stands for calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasias. That's a, an unusual one, but you can get a form thrust of crest where you get some of these and not all of them. So you may get the Raynaud's and the telangiectasias, for instance, and not have the other parts of the syndrome. Xanthelasma is a uh, cholesterol deposits that uh, are often seen in the face, and this may be present in patients with more advanced PBC. Most patients with PBC have an elevated cholesterol, but this is an HDL cholesterol. It does not confer a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. And patients with PBC may have an elevated IgM as opposed to patients with autoimmune hepatitis that have an elevated IgG. So the, the progression of the disease is unusual. Initially, uh, the disease presents only with a positive antimitochondrial antibody and normal serum biomarkers. So you really can't diagnose PBC in this setting. Sometimes patients will walk in with a positive antimitochondrial antibody and I ask why they were tested and they don't know or they may say, well, my mother had PBC, so the doctor tested me. So if a patient has a positive mitochondrial antibody and normal uh, alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin, we don't do anything. We just monitor them until the alkaline phosphatase becomes abnormal. But they're usually destined to go on and develop PBC, but the time that may take is unknown. So typically, then, they develop an asymptomatic illness where the alkaline phosphatase is abnormal the bile ducts begin to get damaged, so they show cholestasis, but this just presents as an elevated alkaline phosphatase, maybe with an elevated bilirubin, usually not. And the patients are picked up by accident, usually doing routine physicals. Then the disease actually enters a 
clinically manifest uh, period where there are loss of more bile ducts, more cholestasis, and the patients actually start itching, complaining of fatigue, and may notice jaundice. And this ultimately leads to cirrhosis and decompensated liver disease. But the period, time period here may be many, many, many years. So we often see patients during the asymptomatic phase, uh, sometimes during the clinical manifest phase, but rarely now in the decompensated phase. Those patients go straight to liver transplant. By the time they're decompensated, starting them on anti, um, you know, anti PBC therapy or effective therapy is almost impossible, and those patients need to go for transplant. But as I said, we only see that now maybe once a year. Now, um, <clears throat> As I said, a substantial number of patients can progress with this condition. Now, that's the typical PBC progression, and it takes place over 10, 15 years or longer. There are some patients that have both features of PBC and autoimmune hepatitis. Um, this is often overdiagnosed because the early phases of PBC can be inflammatory and look like autoimmune hepatitis and even have high enzymes, but Typically, the patients can be treated just with Urso without adding corticosteroids or immunosuppression. They don't require treatment for their auto, for the autoimmune um, portion of the disease. True PBC and autoimmune hepatitis is called overlap syndrome. That occurs in less than, say, 5% of cases. And they typically have features of both diseases, usually on liver biopsy and clinically. And that condition, you have to treat for both autoimmune hepatitis and PBC. I only have a handful of patients with that condition. And then lastly, there's a preductopenic variant, which is a very rapidly progressive disorder that um, is rare, thankfully, does not seem to respond to any of the therapy that we have. And these patients usually end up with cirrhosis and ending up uh, needing a liver transplant within a few years. We have a patient like this now who had no fibrosis at all on a liver biopsy five years ago. She was treated with multiple therapies, never responded. She now has cirrhosis and she's, she does not yet need a transplant, but she's headed in that direction. Fortunately, that's a very rare condition. So um, I mentioned the clinical symptoms of fatigue and puritis. There may be other concurrent autoimmune diseases in PBC as well. The most common one is thyroid disease. But most of these patients do have re reduced bone density. So they get osteopenia or osteoporosis. So I routinely will start bone density studies in females, even in ages uh, where they're premenopausal, where you wouldn't expect bone disease. But I'll still do a bone density just to document whether or not they have uh, normal uh, bone scan. And uh, we have a low threshold to starting these patients on vitamin D and calcium. I urge them all to exercise regularly. And uh, we often have to put them on bisphosphonates early on because their bone disease can progress rapidly. This has to do with the cholestatic uh, portion of the disease and um, the loss of calcium and poor absorption of calcium from the intestinal tract. High cholesterol I mentioned already, and the xanthomas and xanthelasma I mentioned already. Um, so the predictors of prognosis are hard to come by, but uh, there's some data suggesting that the patients that have overlap with a positive ANA, and um, this means a high titer of ANA, like greater than one to 320, and PBC features have a more progressive disease and often end up with liver failure more rapidly. So those patients we have to watch and treat more aggressively. Patients that have positive anti-centromere antibodies, which is a specific marker for Sjogren's syndrome, may also uh, have more rapid condition. And there's this uh, unusual form of anti-nuclear antibody that can also separate out patients, but this is not a clinically available test, so we don't really don't use it in practice. 
What we do use in practice is simple fiber scan. So we do an elastography, and I usually wait until I've paid, uh, treated the patient's uh, PBC well enough so that their alkaline phosphatase is normal or nor near normal, and their bilirubin is normal. So at that point, uh, I will do a fiber scan. And I'm reassured if the fiber scan is normal or has a score less than 9.6 kilopascals, I can feel comfortable that they do not have a progressive disease. On the other hand, if their fiber scan is elevated, despite the fact that they're on adequate therapy, that is concerning. And if I do see that, then I start talking about second line therapies and other things to do. So fiber scan will separate out these patients, but you have to wait until you've started ursotherapy and get them in remission before you do the fiber scan. The other thing obviously will separate them out is platelet count. Platelet count uh, that is low suggests portal hypertension, and therefore the patients are more likely to have esophageal varices, and um, the odds ratio of them having varices is seven to eight times greater if they have a low platelet count. So that's a surrogate marker. And the Mayo risk score, which is a combination of platelet count and bilirubin, is also a predictor. The Mayo risk score is an old fashioned test. It doesn't even include alkaline phosphatase. So it's sort of a gross instrument. By the time you have uh, high bilirubin and low platelets, uh, the horse is out of the barn. You've already got advanced liver disease in that patient. And we, we really don't wait to see that to make any decisions. What about the fatigue? Um, it's sort of hard to get your arms around the fatigue because it's so nonspecific. But you can see here that um, patients that have an FIS uh, score that's low at entry, um, this is a fatigue, um, a, a measure of fatigue. And um, those patients that have an FIS score that's higher typically have a worse prognosis and they have more fatigue, uh, obviously, and that's probably related to their underlying liver disease rather than their PBC. But um, patients with a low FIS score tend to have better survival. But I don't pay that much attention to fatigue. Uh, initially, what I do pay attention to is working it up because I look for other causes. So I look for anemia being a cause of fatigue. I look for poor sleep lack of exercise, all the other things that we usually see explaining fatigue. So uh, what are the most common ones? Anemia, depression, sleep disorder, hypothyroidism, as I mentioned already, thyroid disorders are common with PDC, and medications. So, you know, some of these patients are taking excessive antihypertensive meds, they're taking uh, trazodone, or they're taking Valium, et cetera sometimes during the day, so they're a basket case and they really can't function. Uh, what do you do for the fatigue? Well, obviously, if they're anemic, you treat that. If they're depressed, you treat that. Um, I emphasize regular physical activity because I think it's critical, especially during this COVID period. So, um, you know, I tell them to get a Fitbit and I want to see their that they're walking at least 10,000 steps a day and I show them my Fitbit and tell them I am and you know that, that you can do this, you can make time to do this and make it work. Modafinil um, Provigil is a drug that's approved for narcolepsy but it's sort of a stimulant. So that's pretty unusually, it's unusual that you have to use that. Coffee works just as well in my opinion. But Modafinil can, be prescribed for these patients. And some people have tried methotrexate for severe fatigue. I, I'm not very um, convinced that it's effective. Now, the itching in PBC can be a really bad problem. Um, it can be bad because it tends to be worse at night. So if your patient works and has a job, during the day, and they're up at night scratching all night, they're, they're really not able to function during the day, and it really messes them up. So, um, and they come in complaining of that. Now, we don't know 
why they get the itching. There are lots of uh, theories, whether it's bile salts under the skin or endogenous opioids or histamine or serotonin. Uh, and there are lots of theories about this, but uh, it tends to vary with a diurnal variation. And unfortunately, it's worse at night. Used to usually is worse on the limbs, soles of the feet, and palms of the hands are a very unusual place for people to have itching. So when I ask people, in Southern California, if you ask somebody if they itch, they say yes, because air is dry. So I ask them where. I don't tell them, but I ask them where, and they say, well, my chest and on back or whatever. That's that's usually dry skin. But if they say the soles of my feet or palms of my hands, that is not dry skin. That is specific for cholestasis, and you really don't see that in any other condition except cholestasis. So that's very specific, also inside the ears. And it's worsened by contact with wool, heat, or pregnancy. So in pregnant women that get acute cholestasis of pregnancy when they they really have uh, itching that drives them nuts. What do you do about it? General recommendations, skin moisturizer, obviously if they got dry skin, that's gonna help. But if it's from cholestasis, we usually try bile acids sequestrants first. So cholestyramine is our go-to drug. That's Questran, and it is a um, it's fairly easy to take. It's a powder. You mix it with orange juice or water. I usually have them uh, take one dose a day because it makes them a little gassy, and I have them take it in the morning before breakfast. So, and then I ask them to eat something fatty with breakfast. So if you do that in the morning before you eat, 90% of your bile is stored up in your gallbladder. And if you eat something fatty, uh, your gallbladder contracts and, and puts delivers all your bile into your duodenum. So that's the time the whole have the cholestyramine present. So I have them take the cholestyramine a half hour before breakfast and have them eat something fatty for breakfast. If that, that'll work in about half the patients. If that doesn't work, then you can go to these other drugs. So I, rifampicin is a drug that's approved and used for tuberculosis. So you wouldn't normally give it to somebody with liver disease. If you give a high enough dose of rifampin to somebody with a cholestatic disorder, they become jaundiced because it blocks bile salt exit from the hepatocyte. So we don't like to use it unless the patient's already so far advanced that we know they're gonna need a liver transplant, then we don't really care if their bilirubin goes up, but otherwise we do care. So I instead go to the third line drugs and naltrexone. Naltrexone is an oral opioid agonist, antagonist, excuse me, and um, you can buy it now. It's available in pharmacies, et cetera, because of the opioid epidemic. And um, given in the correct dose, it is effective for itching in a number of patients. If that doesn't work, you can try some SSRIs. Sertraline is one that's been tried and shown to have some efficacy. The osteoporosis I mentioned already is quite common. So these patients um, I'm usually have on vitamin D and calcium and exercise. Hyperlipidemia I mentioned is quite common but it's usually an HLA, HDL, excuse me, <clears throat> elevation of cholesterol. So it does not confer a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, that being said, if you have somebody that is obese or has metabolic syndrome and has a high LDL cholesterol, it should be treated with statins. And we've done studies using statins in patients with PBC and they work quite well. 10 milligrams of atorvastatin seems to be very uh, well tolerated in patients with PBC. And we published that a couple of years ago. Vitamin deficiency is seen, and these are fat soluble vitamins, but not until you have very advanced liver disease. So uh, most of my patients, I don't worry about vitamin deficiency. I tell them to take a multivitamin, but uh, very few of them are vitamin deficient. And then complications. Uh, I mentioned esophageal varices with cirrhosis. PBC is one of the rare diseases where you can actually get um, varices without having cirrhosis. 
So that is because some of these patients develop not, not a form of nodular regenerative hyperplasia, and that causes pressure on the sinusoids of the liver and mimics cirrhosis, so they get portal hypertension and they can get varices. So sometimes we look for these early on, even though the patient doesn't have PBC, and sometimes we actually have to do shunt surgeries. We don't like to do TIPS procedures in patients because this is often way before they end up needing a transplant, so um, we, we manage it some other way. Um, fortunately, hepatocellular carcinoma is rare in PBC, so I do not screen my 150 so ladies with PBC for a pedicellar carcinoma unless they have cirrhosis. So that's the only subgroup of females that I will screen. The, the, that there's a difference, however, between females and males. Males do have a risk for pedicellar carcinoma starting at age 50. So those patients we screen routinely like we screen other people with the liver disease like chronic hepatitis C and B, et cetera. So this is looking at the, the risk of pedicellar carcinoma. You can see it's much higher in men. That's not unusual, by the way. That's also true in hepatitis B. Men are about two and a half to three times more likely to develop pedicellar carcinoma than women. And it's also true in hepatitis C. So um, it's, and there, there's probably a, a protective effect of estrogen. There's other reasons that we don't fully understand. So to make the diagnosis of PBC, the AASLD has now made it fairly simple. In the early years after I was trained and started at Scripps, we had to do liver biopsies on everybody to make the diagnosis. And then we did a liver biopsy every year to monitor them. That's what the Mayo Clinic did. So that's what we did. But about 20 years ago, they changed the criteria and said all you need is an elevated alkaline phosphatase and the presence of a positive antimitochondrial antibody, and you've got the diagnosis. Now, if you do not have a positive AMA and you have a patient with a positive, uh, an elevated alkaline phosphatase that's behaving like they have PBC, then you have to do the liver biopsy and look for non separative destructive cholangitis. <clears throat> or destruction of the intralobular bile ducts, and that's how you make the diagnosis. And I have at least 10 to 15 percent of my patients are diagnosed by biopsy. This is what that looks like, by the way. Uh, this is a florid duct lesion on the left, where you can see what looks like a flower. That's a, that used to be a bile duct, and it's just been totally invaded by um, granulomas and um, by inflammatory cells. And this on the right is a, a bile duct that's disrupted by inflammatory cells and white cells. So that's, those are both diagnostic of PBC. Long-term management of PBC patients, I usually get liver tests every three to six months. Once a patient's in remission on URSO or their, whatever their therapy is, I usually only get labs once every six months, and I usually see them once a year. I do a TSH once a year if they're not on thyroid replacement because they're at high risk for developing hypothyroidism. I check their bone density, as I mentioned. I check their vitamins, as I mentioned. I don't look for fat-soluble vitamins unless they have, uh, I mean, I don't add those unless their bilirubin is high. I only do endoscopy if they have cirrhosis or a high male risk score. And I only do ultrasound and AFP for HCC screening if they're male over age 50 or if they're female with cirrhosis. Now, the mainstay of therapy for PBC is Urso. We've known that for a number of years. It's a non-toxic bile acid that uh, occurs uh, in normal bile salts. So the normal, it's one of the bile salts that occurs in bile in humans. It represents about 3% of normal bile salt, but when we give it orally in a dose of 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day, it uses mass action and displaces the other bile salts in your bile and represents most, the most common bile salt, then it's usually about 75, 80% of bile salts in patients that are taking Urso. And that turns out to be a patoprotective. 
It's a paddle protective in PVC. It's also a paddle protective in a lot of other things. So we use Urso, for instance, in post-transplant patients. We use it in pregnant women with uh, uh, acute cholestasis of pregnancy. We use it in uh, patients that have graft versus host disease. We use it in a lot of conditions because it's protective of the liver. But it turns out to really change the natural history of PBC. And it's the standard of care. All patients with PBC should start with Urso and uh, gradually increase the dose. So it's given twice a day. And it usually results in improvement in liver tests pretty rapidly within oh, three to six months. And the, the maximum uh, improvement typically occurs um, usually in six months to a year. It's safe and it does improve clinical symptoms and delays progression of disease. And it's the reason why most of our patients do not require a transplant now and why they're outpatients. However, uh, up to 40% of patients do not have a optimal response to PBC. So their alkaline phosphatase may come down, but it doesn't come down to normal. And they may still have a slight elevation of bilirubin. So this, assessing the biochemical response is a science in itself. And there are lots of studies that have been done to determine what's an adequate response and what isn't. But most of us have accepted now the the Toronto uh, criteria, which is an adequate response, is having a reduction in alkaline phosphatase to 1.67 times the upper limit of normal or less. So in our laboratory, that's about 200. So if I see an alkphos that starts off at 350 and it comes down to 210, that's a response, but it's not adequate. It's not good enough for us to say, okay, you're in remission. If I see an alkphos that starts at 300 and comes down to 120, I'm happy. Um, anyway, we use these data because there's a large now global trial of over 5,000 people that shows that this response to alk uh, to um, ursa with the alkaline phosphatase is predictive of survival. So if you're a responder, you're on the green line here and you're more likely to have long-term survival, that's good. If you're a non-responder and your alkphos is still above 1.67, your outcome is um, more ominous. So I tell that to patients at the very beginning and they learn to follow their alkphos just like I do. Um, now, uh, when you treat patients that already have cirrhosis with urso, you're probably not having a big impact on their survival. The, you have to get to the patients before they have cirrhosis. So I start patients on urso, even if they do have uh, cirrhosis, but I'm not that hopeful that it's gonna reverse their course. And most of my patients that have been diagnosed that late ultimately end up in transplant or dying from their liver disease. But the non serotic ones do quite well. And that's where we diagnose the disease most commonly now. <clears throat> now, the, up until a few years ago, we only had URSA. Uh, in 2016, we had the approval, or excuse me, 15 now, we had the approval of a second line drug called a beta colic acid, or OCA for short, which is a modified bile acid and an FXR agonist. So it turns out carcinoid X receptor is an important receptor in on the hepatocyte that leads to progression of liver disease in patients with PBC. If you um, can uh, upregulate this receptor, yeah, it's beneficial. And you reduce fibrosis, you reduce inflammation, you improve bile acid homeostasis, in the liver. And so this drug uh, was studied in this, uh, this large landmark study uh, that was published in 2016. Uh, and what was done in this trial was we, we separated patients into three groups, placebo, uh, benicolic acid, 10 milligrams, or a benicolic acid, five milligrams, titrating up to 10 milligrams after six months. 
and we decided who got titrated based on the response they had on alkaline phosphatase. Everybody enrolled in this trial had to have an alkaline phosphatase of greater than 1.67 times the upper limit of normal and uh, or a slightly elevated bilirubin. So that doesn't represent that many patients. Uh, and this, the sites, by the way, that enrolled the best in this trial were from England. And uh, that's why Fred Nevins was the first author on the study. So, <clears throat> and again, that's where they have the most PVC. So what we found was that patients uh, had an excellent response on either the five milligram or the titrating dose of the benefolic acid and placebo had only a slight response until the open label part of the study where you rolled over the placebo patients to the drug and then they had a response as well so the the way the drug is used by the way is in the um, sliding scale or the uh, titrating dose because itching was a major side effect from the drug you can see only about 40% of placebo patients had itching, whereas 50% or more of the benecolic acid patients had itching. The 10 milligram dose definitely causes itching in most patients. I find that the five milligram dose is pretty well tolerated. So I usually start at five milligrams and I titrate up only if I have to, and then I manage their itching if, if it needs to be managed. The other side effects you can see between placebo and the treatment arms were pretty much the same. There have been post-marketing reports of liver failure in patients that already had advanced cirrhosis with obenicolic acid. So the drug actually is not supposed to be dosed in patients with child's pew B or C cirrhosis on a, a, on a daily basis. It's supposed to be dosed on a once weekly dosing of five milligrams and then increase to 10 milligrams. And that's what the label says. But when the drug was first approved, some physicians accidentally dosed it daily in patients with more advanced liver disease. And these patients could go into liver failure. So my recommendation is if you have a patient with decompensated cirrhosis, don't put the monovenicolic acid at all, refer them to a transplant center. And then we will typically um, work them up first for a transplant and then put them on OCA and watch them carefully so we don't uh, run this risk. Um, <clears throat> this paper was published um, last year. We, we looked at long-term outcome in the POISE trial and we had five-year data in a number of the patients it went into the open label phase and we were able to look at reversal of histology and what we found basically was that there was improvement in the liver biopsies besides just seeing the uh, improvement in alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin this was important to see that the histology uh, improved and uh, cholestasis and inflammation improved and liver stiffness uh, got better so these were uh, hard outcomes that the FDA was looking for for approval of the drug. We didn't have enough patients in this trial, but there, there's a large trial showing this. So again, just to remind you about the post-marketing uh, risk of uh, decompensation. Now, since that trial um, <clears throat> was published, there's been another trial of benzofibrate it was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. This was by a French group, and, and there's a good reason for that. So uh, Dr. Poupon was, Raoul Poupon was one of the two doctors that discovered URSA was effective for PVC. And he has subsequently led this group. Um, his uh, his uh, practice is in Paris, but these uh, other physicians are throughout France. So benzofibrate is an approved um, fibrate drug that's been approved for a number of years in Europe, uh, but it is not approved in the United States, it's unfortunately. We have other fibrates that have been approved in the United States, phenofibrates, et cetera. The fibrates, if you remember, were all studied 
and uh, initially approved 40 years ago to lower cholesterol. And they worked for that, but they were not ideal drugs. Some of them caused bloating, gassiness. You had to take them three times a day. Patients didn't like them. And as soon as we had statins, we stopped using fibrates. So most doctors that you talk to today have never used a fibrate, phenofibrate, they don't even know what it is. You have to have been around 35, 40 years ago to remember that it was used to lower cholesterol. But what these doctors did was use it the same way obenicolic acid was used and in patients that had, did not have a normalization of alkaline phosphatase, and it worked just as well as obenicolic acid. So it's very interesting because it does not cause itching the way OCA does. Now, unfortunately, it's not approved. Uh, so we can't get it in the United States, and they can get it in Europe, however. So Intercept has bought the rights to the drug, and now they're formally studying it the proper way uh, with or without a benicolic acid, because this may be a synergistic effect with OCA. So if you add the two together, you may get an, an additive effect and get twice the benefit. Uh, and this shows what happened with benzofibrate. You had a reduction in alkaline phosphatase and your liver enzymes, and the bilirubin came down as well. Liver stiffness looks like it improved. And you did not get the itching like I mentioned that we saw in, um, in other patients. So benzofibrate is also helpful in just improving itching in anybody with a cholestatic condition. So this trial was presented at AASLD, it's not yet been published, but they use benzofibrate just to treat itching in patients with cholestatic disorders like PSC, et cetera, and PBC, and it improved the itching. So it may have a dual benefit there. Now I just show this slide uh, briefly to indicate that you can use budesonide, which is a drug we typically use to treat autoimmune hepatitis. This can be a second line drug also for PVC. And I've used this in rare occasions when a patient can't tolerate obenicolic acid because of itching and, uh, and I can't get benzofibrate if it's not approved. And so I, I may use um, budesonide in some cases uh, because it has a good safety profile. Um, sclerosis and cholangitis, I'm, as I mentioned before, I think I'm just going to stop here. Melissa, I'm not going to talk about, about PSC tonight because there's not enough time, but I'll leave time for questioning. And I'm going to go back to my uh, go back to my main screen here. Anyway, are you there, Melissa? I am, sorry about that. I couldn't get it to come back on, apologies. So thank you so much for that presentation. We do have a couple of questions, so I'll just get started. All right, so firstly, going back to the beginning of your presentation, when we were just talking about PVC in general and talking about the percentage of patients that tend to have a positive AMA, someone was wondering, are we able to actually make that diagnosis of PVC if someone does not have a positive AMA? Yeah, we can. As I mentioned, about 10% of patients uh, do not have a positive AMA and we have to do a liver biopsy, but it's difficult and it requires judgment because you're not going to biopsy everybody that walks in the door. So, you know, if I see a female that's in the right age group over age 40 with an elevated alkaline phosphatase and maybe has no symptoms or says, yeah, I'm fatigued, um, then I... Um, if I, my level of suspicion isn't high enough, I'll do a liver biopsy and make a diagnosis. But unfortunately, there's really no other good marker besides the autoimmune, uh, be, besides the antimitochondrial antibody. There is a special form of anti-nuclear antibody that is not a commercially available test that is sometimes positive in, in these patients. So if you can get your hands on that, that's worth doing. Great, thank you. Another question, um, in regards to the overlap syndrome you were mentioning, somebody asked, can you diagnose that overlap syndrome without needing a liver biopsy? Um, usually not. 
So I don't like the diagnosis if it's diagnosed uh, clinically because it's usually wrong. Um, it's because you have to have features of both disease and you know what will what usually happens is you'll have a patient with PBC that is doesn't respond to urso has AST and ALT levels higher than you expect and has a positive antinuclear antibody. Mm -hmm. And so that patient, um, before I start them on uh, therapy for immunosuppressive therapy, I want to see liver biopsy features of autoimmune hepatitis. Remember that if we make that diagnosis, that's a lifelong diagnosis, and you have to put them on, on immunosuppression for life. Right. So it's right. a serious diagnosis. Absolutely. Moving on to when you were discussing using the fiber scan machine, there was someone who actually must have real life experience with this test and said that, um, how would you explain having a fiber scan result of about 10.8 KPA, but then going forward with a biopsy and showing absolutely no fibrosis? Yeah, that's weird. So I can explain that because fiber scan is not perfect, first of all. So we've, we've shown even in diseases where fiber scan has been validated, like hepatitis C, where we have a thousand studies with fiber scan, whereas in PBC, we only have two studies with fiber scan. Um, it's still not 100% perfect. And if there's a discrepancy between fiber scan and our clinical impression or the laboratory test, then I will resort to a liver biopsy, even in hep C, because it's not perfect. But any inflammation in the liver can make the fiber scan elevated. And remember, the fiber scan has to be done in a fasting state. If the patient's been eating, it makes it falsely high. And uh, But that's why I don't like to do the fiber scan in, in a patient that still has abnormal liver tests at the beginning of their diagnosis, because I'm not sure if that's fibrosis in their liver or if it's actually just... Um, just some inflammation from their PVC. Understood. Okay, you had mentioned briefly um, that nodular regenerative hyperplasia and how it's that pressure problem that can lead to the varices in that condition. Do these patients ever progress to need a transplant or is it just a pressure issue? Yeah, it's a good question. I've only seen it happen a couple times. And unfortunately, um, the one of those patients ended up needing a liver transplant in her 40s, so she progressed. The other patient is not, uh, but it's still a little early, so it's not that common to see. Okay. Um, actually, a, a follow-up question to a previous one you just answered. It says, what was that other AMA test you mentioned that you can do if the AMA was negative? Well, it's a marker that's got a number on it, and I had it on my slide. So you can pull up that slide and show it if you want. Got it. And just to remind everyone, all of these webinars are recorded. So if you do want to go back and reference, they're all there for you. All right. Um, specific question, and I think you may have answered this towards the end of your presentation, but I'll just repeat it. It was stating um, how exactly a phenofibrate helps PBC. So I didn't talk about phenofibrate. So. Okay. Um, I did talk about benzofibrate. Mm -hmm. So phenofibrate is a cousin of uh, benzofibrate. It is approved in the United States. It's one of the fibrates that's approved. And it's been studied in a very small trial by Cynthia Levy in 10 patients with PBC and as a second line drug. And it did show some benefit. Now, um, Phenofibrate is probably never going to be properly studied in PVC for two reasons. One, it's off patent, so nobody's going to spend the money that it takes to do a phase three trial and get a drug approved um, because it's very expensive. And number two, because there it has labeling that says phenofibrate is dangerous in patients with cirrhosis, specifically in patients with PVC. Now that's a historical issue they, because phenofibrates, the all fibrates cause some liver test abnormalities in some patients, probably related to fatty liver and not to fibrate, but we don't have data to prove that. But it says on the label, don't take this if you have PVC. 
So when right. I use it in, with PVC patients, I explain that to them. I tell them that the use is off label. I tell them I'm gonna give them the smallest dose there is of phenofibrate, and I'm gonna watch them carefully. Mm. And that being said, I've had about half a dozen patients respond and um, have their, they didn't respond to obinicolic acid or they couldn't take it or they got itching with it or et cetera. And they did respond to phenofibrate and they're still on it. So they're on Urso and phenofibrate. I actually had a comment from a patient, not a question, stating that actually they found that their itching really improved with being on a phenofibrate. So interesting. Yeah. yeah so that was what they found with benzofibrate and the, the, the properly done trials that are being uh, work as they've started now. Intercept uh, is, is is rolling them out now, and the um, we're not a site, but uh, Mayo Clinic Scottsdale is. Um, I didn't agree to be a site just because I don't feel I have an adequate number of patients that can enroll in it because you have to have failed multiple lines of therapy, mm -hmm. and it doesn't happen that often. But Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. Um, they have a lot of patients, so they're going to be in the strike. But that's one of the things they're going to monitor is itching. Okay. Another question, I'll read it verbatim. It says, I have PBC and PSC overlap. Is there any general data about time frame of disease progression with the overlap? Are there any predictors of speed of progression or are all cases different? Yeah, so PSC, PBC overlap. That's what she said, or he said, or. That's what was typed. Not yeah. All, yeah, so what I talked about was, was autoimmune. Yeah. I talked about PBC autoimmune hepatitis overlap. Uh, that condition, as I, I showed you the data, can be more serious. You have to go on immunosuppressive therapy. Mm -hmm. PBC PSC overlap has been described, and I didn't go through my PSC slides. So it's a whole nother talk, but that's a rare condition. Mm -hmm. And that would likely progress like PSC. So unfortunately, we don't have good drugs for PSC. We have good drugs for PBC, but not PSC. Got it. Um, one other question, and I think we're okay. Then I think we'll be finished unless anybody else wants to give their last minute questions. And it was about HCC screening in PBC. And now you had mentioned discrepancy between women and men. Um, they're asking mm -hmm. specifically, though, if it is a woman and they have cirrhosis, they shall, then they should be screened, correct? Because of cirrhosis? Correct. Okay. Correct. But of all my patients over the years with PBC, um, I've only had one develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, I've had one develop HCC post liver transplant. Mm -hmm. You know who that is, Melissa. But um, that was in the graph. But I've ha seen about half a dozen men show up with uh, cirrhosis and HCC. So it's, and they're usually older men. So that's where I really look for HCC as an older man. Thank you. I believe I'm just scanning quickly to make sure I haven't missed any other questions. No, I believe that is everybody's contribution of questions for tonight, which leaves us within 60 seconds of 6.30 anyway. So it looks like we made great. good time. Well, Thanks thank you so much. much. Macros. This was such a great lecture, lots of great information. I'm sure we all learned a lot. And thank you again to Gilead and Isai for sponsoring our events. And we really hope that you'll join us again for more of our webinars. Thank you for the invitation. Take care. Bye-bye.